Welcome to the Times of Industry show. I'm very happy to have back on the show Mr. David Stockman, uh, an American politician, a foreign businessman, and, and he was uh, um, uh, the Republican U.S. Representative for the state of Michigan between 77 and 81, Director of the Office of uh, Management and Budget, which is a phenomenally important but, uh, office between 81 and 85 during the Reagan years. Um, and he has a phenomenal newsletter, David Stockman's uh, QuantraCorner.com, and he covers a whole host of issues there. Love that newsletter. And uh, David, we're so happy to, ba- to have you back on the, uh, on, the, on the line because every time you, you come on, you get great feedback. And I wanted to ask you a lot of important questions. So thank you for being here. Yeah, well, I'm really uh, glad to be with you. And, uh, you know, there's so many things to talk about right now because we are literally in uncharted water. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and think we're in a different universe. I mean, who would have imagined that we shut down the entire economy? Uh, in April, industrial production collapsed by about 17%, which if you look at the historical data, that's the worst monthly decline since 1919 in a century. I mean, it's even uh, a deeper decline last month, and I just use that as uh, one metric, but a deeper decline than we had during the worst month of the Great Depression. Uh, Obviously, we got uh, more than 33 million people unemployment claims. That's about 10 times the worst uh, uh, for eight weeks that we had during the Great Recession, which we thought was the end of the world back in 08 and 09. So we're in a deep, deep amount of trouble. Uh, Everything's out of control. The the Fed is printing money like no one imagined possible. Congress is passing trillion-dollar spending bills without reading them. The Fed, the Treasury is borrowing money like, you know, it's actually borrowed nearly three uh, trillion dollars in the last 60 days uh, since uh, Trump declared, uh, you know, the state of emergency on COVID. Then we have the entire public caught up in an absolute hysteria about this thing. You know, I don't doubt it's highly contagious and for a certain small segment of the population, the age, the infirm, people with uh, pre-existing or uh, serious medical afflictions already, um, you know, respiratory illnesses, uh, cardiovascular illnesses, renal illnesses, diabetes, and so forth, it can be very serious and they need to uh, take all uh, precautions to protect themselves. But for the general population uh, over, under 65 in generally good health, this thing is uh, only slightly worse than our normal seasonal influenza. And yet we have the whole country shut down. We have panic. We have the mainstream media, CNN, you know, almost uh, conducting an hourly death watch. Uh, th- this, this is madness. And uh, we're not going to uh, bounce out of this uh, in a month or two just because the weather gets warmer this summer. We've really, uh, we've gone off the deep end here. Yeah, it's very interesting. It's, a, it's almost a human experience in, in how we re- react to the unknown, right? It was just a yeah. novel virus. We, and yeah. we even had previous uh, coronaviruses. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sure. We've had coronaviruses and we've had very bad strains of, you know, influenza uh, for, uh, well, I mean, from time immemorial, actually. And in modern times for decades, you know, I remember being a college student and 1968, 1969, we had the Hong Kong flu then. If you actually look at the numbers, which uh, people don't uh, do because they're so caught up, you know, in the short term uh, panic and hysteria here, uh, you know, s- something like the equivalent of 170,000 people died in that 68, 69 Hong Kong flu, 60. Uh, per 100,000, which is about triple the uh, uh, so-called mortality rate from COVID-19 that we've experienced today. Now, the reason I mention all this, obviously, is that nobody shut down the economy, nobody closed the schools. I was in graduate school then. The factories uh, kept going, uh, the restaurants stayed open, the highways were open, the country was, uh, you know, stayed in business. People. Uh, took precautions, uh, maybe they uh, elevated their uh, hand washing and hygiene and in cer- certain cases where there were very bad hot spots, uh, I can uh, recall some people wore masks for a while, but this was a equally virulent winter flu, a really bad spring, a strain that went around the world, 
killed something like a million and a half people worldwide. And yet the reaction back then was totally different than it is today. And it's ironic because at the time this hit, we had Lyndon Johnson in the White House. Now, if there was ever a big government man who wanted to throw, on, throw around the weight of government and meddle and intervene and, uh, you know, get in um, on all fours, that was Lyndon Johnson. But even Lyndon Johnson, uh, who was a lame duck at that point, had already announced he wasn't running, uh, didn't declare a national emergency. He didn't encourage the governors to, you know, uh, issue all these stay at home and essentially uh, house arrest orders. None of that happened. And so it tells you that really in the last half century, the last 50 years, we have gotten so used to what I call the big nanny in Washington, uh, big government uh, stepping into everything uh, in life from A to Z, that um, we even have a so-called Republican in the White House, and I don't think Trump is much of a Republican, but you have a Republican in the White House who listens to a couple of doctors who are out to lunch for a, a couple of days in mid-March, and uh, all of a sudden declares the national emergency and opens the door, ironically, to all these Democratic governors and mayors to shut down their economy, create enormous hardship and fear, and then blame uh, Trump for what they've done. I mean, we are really uh, in, in a uh, political uh, food fight here, the likes of which I don't think we've ever seen. And, you know, I've been in politics since uh, I started working on Capitol Hill in 1970. I've never seen anything remotely close uh, to the madness that's underway right now. Well, you know what? That, that is my first question to you, actually. What is it like being a politician right now? Um, you know, whether it be a senator or a congressman and obviously inside of the White House, what is it like? What, what's your hours? Um, what do you have to deal with, deal with on a daily basis? I mean, what is it like to uh, yeah. manage this thing? Well, you know, unfortunately, these guys keep themselves busy from dawn till dusk uh, normally. And I'm sure now it's even more, you know, enhanced. They're on steroids running around. But that, that's, that's, hard, that's part of the problem. Uh, when you have a bunch of politicians who know very little, certainly they're not medical experts, they're not epidemiologists, uh, they haven't studied uh, you know, the history of these kinds of uh, uh, viral, uh, virus-based uh, 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 diseases and uh, pandemics, and yet they're all running around uh, spending money, uh, making uh, suggestions, and getting the government involved in the middle of everything in a way that uh, is totally counterproductive. It would be far better if these people, you know, actually did what Nancy Pelosi was trying to suggest, and that is they all stay home uh, and quarantine themselves. You know, I, 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 my view is if we would have quarantined the Congress and the White House and the departments and let the rest of the country uh, cope with this the best it could, People know what to do. Old people know uh, that they better not be exposed. Uh, people that run nursing homes know that their uh, populations are uh, very uh, vulnerable and they should have taken all kinds of uh, precautions. But uh, we didn't need the Congress and the White House and Donald Trump and Dr. Fauci and uh, Dr. Burks, I call her the scarf lady. She stands and stood up there day after day you know, for weeks, scaring the hell out of people, telling them things that, uh, you know, weren't in context. And uh, now we have, uh, as, as I say, probably the biggest social hysteria underway in this country right now uh, that, we, that we've ever had. Uh, and, you know, it could go all the way back to 1692 and the Salem witch trials, really, in terms of uh, the irrationality that's rampant everywhere. David, let me ask you something. Yesterday, I watched uh, Steve Mnuchin and uh, Chairman Powell speak with uh, with the Banking Committee, and yes. then like a Democrat senator came in and started attacking like a dog. Um, Steve Mnuchin was, and he was his his uh, thesis was, "Hey, how much people are we gonna uh, are we gonna sacrifice?" by opening up the economy just to get another squeeze of GDP, et cetera. It was, uh, it was trying to politicize uh, becoming a, 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 a biological criminal for suggesting to open up the economy 
because we want to, um, you know, get another uh, bonus for Wall Street, etc. Why is it being so politicized? Uh, why are the Democrats sort of taking the position of, hey, uh, health is number one and uh, the Republicans is uh, sort of being projected as money is number one. And that's sort of the debate. But, uh, you know, why is it? But what, what's the deal? Why are they well, trying to, yeah, to create a political yeah. thing out of it? Well, uh, there are two things. One, Washington's become more and more and more political decade after decade. But once Trump was elected, we got this Trump derangement syndrome set in in what I call the imperial city, Washington. Uh, and it infected everyone, the Democrats especially, uh, you know, have uh, very serious cases, cases of the Trump derangement syndrome. But most of the Washington establishment, the deep state, the mainstream media, whatever you want to call it, and uh, they tried three times to take the Donald down, uh, first uh, with Russiagate, uh, and that was uh, a total hoax, as it's now, uh, I think, uh, fairly apparent to everyone except CNN. Uh, then they went after Ukraine Gate. Uh, there was nothing there. That was another fizzle. Then they, in desperation, tried the impeachment, and that ended in a whimper, not a bang. And uh, essentially, uh, COVID came along, uh, a bad winter flu, uh, a bad case of it in uh, Wuhan, China, and the communist rulers of China decided to regiment the town and lock it down and put everybody under house arrest. That created uh, another uh, sort of fear uh, opening. And so when Trump made the huge mistake of not fighting this, he should have said, you know, we can take care of this. We're, we're a strong country and most people are healthy enough, uh, you know, to, uh, if you have to uh, uh, get it, uh, you are either asymptomatic or you have a mild case of winter flu and then you move along. And for the very small 5% of the population that's seriously at risk, we need to do everything we can uh, to help them stay out of harm's way. Now that's what Trump should have said, <laughs> what he said, was that we're declaring a national emergency. We got to stop this thing in his tracks. Uh, he then ran this stupid uh, daily uh, coronavirus task force briefing uh, and put these doctors out there. And Fauci, I think, is you know uh, I, the evil genius behind all this. Uh, first of all, he's 79 years old. He should have retired long ago. <clears throat> but as far as I'm concerned, he's just a pretentious bag of wind who never thought this through, gave Trump a bad, bad idea. But once you have a national emergency, and once you have Dr. Fauci out there every day uh, in the White House briefing room, it was just open season for the Democrats. So they've now gone nuts uh, because they think this is their uh, last great hope uh, to politically attack uh, the president. But, um, you know, we, we need to look at some facts here. Uh, they shut down all the schools in the country. They shut down all the restaurants, the bars, uh, gyms, social clubs, uh, places where uh, younger people go. But, you know, if you take all the people in the United States who are under 24 years of age, let's call it the school age population, primary, secondary, college, there's 104 million people in that category. And 79, there have been 79 only with COVID deaths over all of this time the last uh, three months. Let's repeat now, that, just so, I'm, just so I'm clear. 104 million Americans out of 340 are yes, 24 and under. Yes, let's call it the kids and, and students nation. Let's call it the students uh, nation, 104 okay. million. And 79 been have been, what, infected or, or ventilated? No, there's been 79 deaths in that entire population. 79 okay? deaths. Okay, and is that like residue of coronavirus or is that the primary? Th was he hit by a truck and he had coronavirus? Because they're overcounting. Well, even then, yes, that's a very good point. Those are from the CDC and it's uh, with, and I underscore this with capital letters, with coronavirus. It doesn't mean that coronavirus was necessary necessarily the cause, but that's the way they're being classified and reported by this very expansive uh, reporting system, which is designed 
to inflate the body count. Yeah, that's not even that. a rounding error of a rounding error. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, well, but I want to give the I want right. to give it if, if I can. I want to put it in per hundred thousand because when you look at the other age groups, you begin to get the picture. But here it is, seventy nine out of one hundred three million. That's a rounding error that you can't even write down with enough zeros. It's one tenth of a person per hundred thousand. Now, so why in the hell have we shut down all the schools? Now, let me move on to what I call the bar hopping uh, uh, demographic uh, cohort, uh, people 25 to 34. There's 46 million people in that category. There has been one death per 100,000. It's a rounding error. During the Say that again. So 25 to 44, we have how many people in America? 25 to 34. Yeah. And there are 46 million people in America in that category. How many deaths? Uh, one per 100,000, 450 deaths. One per 100,000. Now, gotcha. one per 100,000, let me tell you what that means. During the same three months, see, I'm counting the period which that there are now, uh, let's say, uh, computing these uh, so-called COVID deaths. They started February 1, and you know now we're in mid May. During that same period, uh, there have been 31 per 100,000 deaths in that same age category, 25 to 34, from all the other causes. Uh, accidents, frankly, drug overdoses, suicides, and other medical conditions uh, that, although few and far between, do afflict some young people. So in other words, the normal causes of death, 31 per 100,000 uh, for a three month period, that's about normal year in and year out. That's 31 times more deaths than have been attributed to COVID. And yet they've shut down everything that these people do, their bars, their restaurants, their jobs, uh, you know, their health clubs, uh, the nail salons, uh, theirs, wherever they go. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Then one last uh, statistic, or two statistics, I think I'll round out the picture. If you then take uh, the population uh, 34 to 54, okay? Now that's the heart of the workforce. That's the heart of, let's call it, the parent uh, nation, the parent generation, uh, you know? And even if you take uh, that uh, group, uh, um, the uh, total death rate in that group uh, it's been only five per 100,000. And again, just a tiny fraction of the normal. So then the question you ask is, well, what's all the hoopla about? Why do they have the march of death across the CNN screen every night? What are they counting? The answer is 80% of all of these so-called with COVID deaths are among people 65 and over. Half of those are 80 and over, and virtually all of them had serious uh, cardiovascular uh, issues uh, or respiratory issues or serious cases of diabetes, uh, blood disorders. Um, they had one know. foot out the door anyways, he's saying. Well, it, it's kind of an <laughs> awkward way to say it, I guess, but, uh, you know, Every year, uh, every day, there's 800,000 deaths in America, day in and day out. Yeah, I guess the, the question is, what's the overage, right? What's the difference between normal times? Yeah. And yeah, the overage, what's the excess? And actually, if you look at that period, there's almost no excess because they're counting what might otherwise be attributed to, let's say, pneumonia or influenza or a heart attack or a traffic accident. Um, they're attributing uh, some of those normal year in, year out, uh, uh, unfortunate, you know, mortalities that occur in our society. Nobody's immortal, obviously. Uh, they're attributing that to uh, COVID and then reporting it daily. I mean, if we had uh, on CNN or NBC a uh, banner running across the bottom of the screen reporting the number of cardiovascular deaths every day, it would be far, far higher uh, than uh, it is for COVID. Um, but, you know, they've, flaunt, they've locked onto this thing. Uh, I guess it's uh, helping their ratings. It's helping them sell advertising. <laughs> Unfortunately, 
And so more importantly, it's a way of prosecuting the case uh, you know, for those who are suffering from um, the, uh, you know, Trump derangement syndrome, it's just their fourth uh, uh, run uh, at uh, trying to uh, uh, take him down. Okay, well, let's, let's talk about that. So, uh, Trump derangement syndrome. We, we have Trump on the one hand, he's getting a lot of uh, ratings, a lot of uh, airtime, I should say, every day. Um, and then you have on the other side, uh, Joe Biden, who uh, did not get a chance to kind of, yeah. t- t- is this working on Trump's behalf? Is this working on uh, Biden's behalf? Biden's gotten uh, into a lot of trouble right now with uh, Obamagate, et cetera. Could, what do you think is yeah. going to happen in the coming elections? Because uh, obviously yeah. Trump has said, I'm not going to uh, postpone or anything like that, nothing about that. So we have an election in just a few months. Um, what's going to happen? Well, uh, you know, if, if uh, we all had a crystal ball, we might have a foggy idea. But as I said at the beginning, the, we're in totally uncharted waters. We've never had this kind of vicious political fight. We've never had a, uh, a plenary quarantine of the entire population for what is, you know, this isn't the Black Death. We've not been invaded by a hostile foreign power. There are no green men from Mars that have suddenly you know, landed uh, on the Capitol steps. This is a serious health uh, uh, challenge to a very small share of the population, but it doesn't uh, even remotely justify the madness that's underway uh, with all of the uh, lockdown and, you know, all of the political fight uh, that's going on um, as a result of it. So, therefore, we, it's very hard to see how this uh, comes out. Nobody ever shut down a whole economy in 60 days, which they did. Now they're going to try to reopen it, and there's going to be endless arguments about the pace of reopening. And what is reopening? You know, they say 50 states are reopening. Well, if you tell restaurants you can reopen at a quarter of capacity, what does that mean? I mean, uh, most of them couldn't possibly make ends meet if they're only filling every fourth table or they have to go to all kinds of uh, crazy, weird lengths uh, to, uh, you know, uh, meet standards for reopening. As I say again, most people who go to restaurants are under 60. There is no serious excess death threat at risk to people under 60. Uh, and uh, they should, you know, we should be going to restaurants and, and not, uh, you know, uh, hiding out uh, uh, in uh, house arrest and uh, behind the mask. Uh, everywhere uh, in America. This, this, this is really crazy. Now, the reason I'm saying this is how do you open when you have so much fear being propagated every day by the mayors, the governors, by the kind of senator you mentioned uh, from the hearing yesterday, even uh, Trump's advisors, you know? I mean, the best thing they could do would be to fire Fauci and say the man was dead wrong. He led us to make a huge mistake, uh, the general quarantine, a lockdown nation, and we're going to move away from this very rapidly because we got to get people back to work. We got to get the economy functioning. You know, that's you what know? I thought uh, uh, he did with Mike Pence. That's why I thought he put him at, at the, the head of the task force. It was like classic, let's put him on. If it doesn't work, we can always say uh, it's Pence, uh, it's Pence fault. Yeah, well, I, but Pence has been staying around, uh, you know, in the background. Uh, it's kind of hard to blame him. Uh, you, you blame the doctors. You blame Dr. Burks. You blame Dr. Fauci. You j- blame the CDC. Uh, you blame uh, the WHO. You blame the whole uh, set of nonprofits and think tanks that are funded by Bill Gates uh, because they're all in this head over heels. Uh, locking, uh, you know, licking their chops. Well, what a wonderful opportunity. We have everybody scared to death. Now let's just keep uh, our thumb on the whole system until we can get everybody vaccinated. Now, and I'm, let's not totally, stop. Sorry. Uh, I'm not totally against vaccinations. If they come up with a safe and effective vaccine that's properly tested over a long period of time, fine. Uh, you know, if some people want to be vaccinated, they should. But where we're going with this is uh, mandatory vaccinations if you want to venture out the front door of your house. I mean, I hope that doesn't happen, but you can be damn sure that that's what this whole crowd of CDC, the WHO, 
all the Gates uh, think tanks uh, are going to be recommending very shortly. And then we're going to have one hell of a fight uh, in the United States because that is utterly unconstitutional. It's a fundamental assault on our individual liberties uh, under uh, the First Amendment and a lot of other amendments for that matter. And I, I think we're heading down that road. Well, David, let me ask you something in closing. What is going to happen or what are some of the unintended consequences that have to do with printing all this money, aiding, loaning, buying the entire Russell 2000 junk bonds, all that stuff? Uh, you know, if the bond market was not already destroyed as a result of QE123 and, you know, taking the Fed's balance sheet from a billion or trillion on the eve of the great financial crisis to four and a half trillion, uh, which was totally unnecessary. It didn't help the economy recover. It just reinflated Wall Street and uh, reinflated to even uh, more, uh, you know, egregious extent uh, all, all the bubbles that have been uh, generated over several decades. But then in that, in that context to do what they've done in the last 60 days is, uh, you know, it's incredible. As I said before, um, with the day or the day before that Trump declared the national emergency, March 13th, balance sheet of the Fed was 4.3 trillion. Last Wednesday, it was 6.9 trillion. And when, when we get the numbers for the latest week, it'll be over 7 trillion. All right, so they, they printed 2.7. They're probably going to about 10 trillion. No, it's heading there, yeah. But they printed in 60 days, 2.7 trillion you know, of uh, uh, fiat credit snatched out of midair, they hit hit the key on the digital uh, printing press. That's forty-two billion dollars a day of uh, you know fake money that's being injected into the system. Now, where the hell that leads, uh, you know, uh, we're going to find out obviously in the next years. But it's crazy as hell because it's driving interest rates on almost everything to uh, the zero bomb. So therefore, uh, all these companies that recklessly uh, borrowed to the hilt in order to buy back their stock or do overpriced or uh, unproductive M&A deals, uh, they're getting bailed out uh, because they can now go to the market that's totally, bond market, totally backstopped by the Fed uh, and continue to borrow, uh, you know, at three, four percent, even two percent uh, in some cases. And, you know, you can take it from there. Um, the, the governments, uh, you know, we're going to have a $4 trillion federal deficit this year alone, $4 trillion. Spend $7 trillion, take in $3 trillion. You're going to borrow more uh, money. You're going to borrow more money uh, to fund the government than the revenue coming in. Uh, you know, this, this is uh, crazy stuff. This is uh, madness that uh, even five or 10 years ago, if you would, would have asked, um, you know, even liberal Keynesians at Harvard uh, Economics Department, they would have uh, shaken their head in disbelief. Yet here we are, and then we have the House Democrats uh, coming right up, uh, you know, the, the fairway there after the three trillion first bailout, so-called CARES Act. Now they got something they call the HEROES Act, which is the very opposite. It, it's really the Villains Act, another three trillion. You know, what, what do they think? We have a rich Uncle Sam somewhere? The guy's broke. <laughs> There's 25 trillion of debt now, and it's uh, rising uh, hundreds of billions a week. And, um, you know, that's where we are. David, all fascinating stuff. David Stockman's uh, ContraCorner.com, uh, brilliant newsletter. Thank you very much for, for being on the show today. Very good, and uh, we'll uh, talk again and see how this thing unfolds. But unfortunately, I don't think uh, it's going to be in, uh, in a very happy way. Well, thank you, sir. Okay, very good.